He currently uh, he is currently co-director co of the Center for Theater Research and senior lecturer in the Department of Literature, Film and Theater Studies at the University of Essex. Liam co-founded Analog in 2007, an award-winning independent theater company with whom he devised work that toured the UK and internationally. Liam was co-convener of the Intermediality in Theater and Performance Research Working Group at the IFTR conference from 2017 to 2021. His recent books include Immersive Embodiment, Theatres of Mislocalized Sensation, uh, and uh, Theatre Rights Animating Puppets, Objects and Sides with uh, Sue Buckmaster, and uh, Avatar's Activism and Post-Digital Performance, Precarious Intermedial, Intermedial Identities, co-edited with Karen Savage. Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter. I'm just going to attempt to, to share my screen, so bear with me just a, a second. OK, can everybody see that OK? Excellent. OK, brilliant. Well, thanks ever so much, Peter, for the introduction. And thank you very much to Kim for the invitation to join you as part of the uh, lecture series here in the Department of Theatre, Film and Television Studies at Aberystwyth University. Um, it's a great pleasure to join you. I know I'm reaching you at the very end of term and many of you have come fresh from meetings and are probably um, reaching a point of, of online exhaustion with the amount of screens I'm sure that we've all been confronted with. So just to say thank you for those of you that, that have joined me uh, so close to the, the, the holiday break. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about practice, um, some practices that are taken directly from my own practices research. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the work of adjacent makers and artists that I draw on in order to, to develop a critical position uh, around empathy activism, which is going to be a, a focus of this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking predominantly about pre-pandemic practices, which I realise at this point with the rise in Omicron might feel like quite a remote and distant land. <laughs> Uh, but the implications of the kinds of practices that I'm going to focus on and the possibilities in a post-pandemic landscape that I hope might carry some resonances and create some urgencies that we might uh, focus on and discuss um, after the presentation. So I want to start by, by, by talking about a, a performance that I attended in 2016. So the summer of 2016, I participated in a short 15-minute virtual reality telepresence performance uh, by anti-disciplinary collective Be Another Lab using a system called The Machine to Be Another. So this event was hosted by Good Chance Encampment, who are an arts project previously located in the Calais Jungle Refugee Camp before temporarily relocating to London South Bank for a programme of theatre, art, music and discussion. The Machine to Be Another incorporates low-budget creative commons technology and knowledge derived from neuroscientific studies in embodiment. The performance uses two Oculus Rift VR head-mounted displays and with built-in cameras that reverse a live feed to enable both a user and a, a refugee performer located in the same room but concealed behind a partition to occupy the virtual body of another. I'm going to show a very brief video clip from an early performance experiment by Be Another Lab called, that they term as gender swap. Um, I should note this is not taken directly from the piece I'm discussing with, uh, with refugee performers, but it is quite a useful illustration of the kind of practice that they share. So I'm going to try and share this with you. I'm gonna, there's been some issues with sound, so I'm going to turn the sound off, but just for the purposes of visual illustration, I'm just going to share this with you. Thank you. 
So I hope that gives some sense of at least the technical setup of, of the Another Labs um, virtual body swapping work. So whilst um, in this, back in this performance in 2016, whilst I experienced my reposition gaze from the first person vantage point of a refugee, I was prompted to draw a picture associated with their experience of camp life. My physical movements were mirrored in real time by the unseen volunteer refugee. And correspondingly, I felt as though I had agency over their mediatized body image. Simultaneously, I was hearing pre-recorded story of their life in the camp recorded via, um, via a set of headphones. The uncanny slippage between self and other concluded with the removal of our VR headsets and our headphones and a face-to-face -face encounter with the body in front of me, the body that I had been. While participating in this virtually embodied narrative, I remember looking down at my female body image, the tattooed arms that I held in front of me, proprioceptively feeling like mine, whilst identifiably not being my own. I began to ask questions of my newfound selfhood, or perhaps my peculiar otherness. Was this illusory transaction in body ownership across not only different social, political and gender boundaries, but also across the borderlands of the skin, symp symptomatic of a radical empathic act? Or should I feel a sense of unease at my perceptual colonization of the volunteer refugees' mediatized body image in this hyper verbatim piece? Could a participant possibly exit their headset feeling that they know or have possessed an experience of camp life that was never theirs to own in the first place? Or was this occupation of the other a form of well meaning cyber tourism? Be another lab's interdisciplinary practice, whilst not framed by the collective as applied theatre, is consistent with Helen Nicholson's description as practices that often involve the particip participation of casualties of a new world order. For example, refugees, asylum seekers, the displaced and the homeless. It provides a tool for refugees to transmit their first person accounts to others and has been used not only in arts festivals and exhibitions, but in other diverse contexts from workshops with different community groups to collaborations with neurologists to explore the potential uses of the machine as a rehabilitation system. The system has also been trialled by the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations in a workshop on intergenerational trauma designed for young leaders in the Somali diaspora as a story sharing tool. In this way, the possibilities of VR co combined with telematics to transport the user are put to effect by planting individuals safely into situations associated with social crises through an entirely different form of knowledge transmission. The aim is to cultivate empathy and tolerance for those directly involved in events in Calais, in the, in the example of the performance I attended. And certainly in the wake of Brexit and with the US suspension of the refugee admissions program back in January 2017, interventions that may enable individuals and policymakers to take up the position of refugees and to learn from their perspective could play a vital part in increasing empathy, if efficacious. But it, it's the efficacy and ethics associated with these emergent sets of embodiment techniques that I'm proposing require critical scrutiny. Haito Style argued that with the digital proliferation of imagery and networked practices, too much world has become available to us. And certainly mid-pandemic, it would be logical to hypothesise that even greater excess of the world as experienced through increased screen time across a range of devices is highly likely as various aspects of our lives have migrated online. Connected to the frenzied excess of the online image pool, deep fake apps such as Zeo, FaceApp and Reface rebranded from its original name, Duplicat, uh, have enabled the rapid creation of deep fake images, GIFs and videos that implant a user's facial image from selfies via their smartphone's live camera or camera roll onto celebrities' body representations with all the novelty and bodily distortions associated with the funfair hall of mirrors. Um, though I only, I only have space to briefly touch on the role of artificial intelligence, general uh, generative adversarial networks and machine learning in, the, in theatre within this presentation. It's something that I've begun to critically explore in my scholarship, most recently in a chapter in the book that Peter mentioned, uh, Avatars Activism and Post-Digital Performance. But with VR body swapping, potentially even the realm of the subjective experience of others becomes fetishised as phenomenologically accessible through reproducible and proprioceptively inhabitable mediatized body images. I intend to use this talk to disentangle the ethics of 
the increasingly fused and chimeric identities uh, in works of art that smuggle body transfer illusions into aesthetic experiences and other diverse contexts such as location-based VR video gaming and in particular applied art in healthcare. Uh, so this is a, a theme that's particularly central to a research monograph I published in 2019 entitled Immersive Embodiment. Um, my recent research in both my own practice and my investigation into the practice of others uh, focuses on emerging modes of immersive performance that incorporate uh, scientifically tested body transfer illusions in the attempt to place audiences inside first person reconstructions of seemingly ineffable experiences of otherness. For example, the neurological subjects living through diverse bodily experiences such as traumatic brain injury. It's very difficult to use the word immersion without also acknowledging the caveat that it's an unhelpfully multifarious concept that's been defined using a variety of theories in relation to many different cultural practices, from levels of attention and, and engagement in game immersion, uh, to what psychologist uh, Mihai Chik Sentmihai refers to as a state of flow in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. From empathic public awareness raising virtual reality charity apps, for example, first person simulations intended to enhance tolerance and symptom recognition in Alzheimer Research's UK, UK's A Walk Through Dementia app to the intensification of affects in entertainment, for example, feeling what we imagine our avatar might in location-based VR video gaming. In my historicizing of immersion as a concept, I've reread art critic and historian Michael Fried's discourse in his book, Art and Objecthood from the 1960s. And whilst, whilst Fried's arguments are seemingly antagonistic to notions of, of immersion, conversely, I position them as foundational to proto-immersive discourse. In Fried's influential book, that notably influential in precisely the direction that he didn't intend, um, he criticised a phenomenon he first observed in minimalist art, which he calls the theatrical condition. Part of what epitomises Fried's notion of the theatrical condition is the presence of the beholder that brings about the completion of the artwork. And it's the beholder's body as part of the artwork that provides a crucial precondition for the eclectic kinds of immersive practices um, that I'm going to discuss. But increasingly, body images can also be experienced not just as a representation out there, but felt as incorporated within an immersant's own body schema in virtual reality. Laboratory-based scientific experiments in self-attribution have raised profound new questions about what counts as a real body. Such experiments have long coincided, though, with gallery-based um, art installations that, unlike the scientific paradigm, don't seek to draw on bodies as the locus for truth in repeatable and objectively measurable experiments, but playfully prompt different kinds of perceptual distortions and enable gallery visitors to take tentative first steps into habituating new modes of perspective taking. For example, in 1993, artist Catherine Richards' virtual body installation invited its viewers to insert their arm into a wooden case that was reminiscent of a 19th century stereoscope. They'd look through a view viewfinder positioned in the top of the box to see an illusion in which their hand, framed within the backdrop of a miniaturized Rococo room, uh, seemingly began to drift infinitely away from them. Notably, the setting of a miniature Rococo room seems quite appropriate as a very early example of 18th century immersive spectator enveloping technology uh, intended to surround or transport uh, its inhabitants decoratively. So Richard's piece creates perceptual um, conflict between the participants proprioceptive sense of their arm being attached to their body and the contradictory visual information that their arm optically is receding away into virtual space. And this blurring of clear distinct uh, boundaries between the spectator and the art object is, I would suggest, a cyborgian state um, that's also, I argue, symptomatic of Michael Fried's notion of the subject-object disruptions that are encapsulated by the idea of the theatrical condition. The crossing over of the participating body into simulated experiences offers a version of the immersive desire of body, bodies entering information. Embodiment is a word much like immersion that has carried innumerable distinctions with post-structuralist commentators rejecting the notion that the body is a container of the self. Media theorists since the 1960s arguing that technology is an extension of the human senses, 
or radical transhumanist discourses that have long disavowed bodies entirely through universalizing narratives towards their post-evolutionary obsolescence. Performance scholar Sean May made, I think, a very valuable distinction between bodies as physical matter contained within the epidermal boundary and embodiment as a body's phenomenological correlate, which can extend both beyond uh, and behind the skin. For Mia Parry and Carmen Liliana Medina, embodiment refers to bodies as whole experiential beings in motion, both inscribed and inscribing subjectivities. For them, the experiential body is both a representation of a self, a text, as well as a mode of creation in progress or a tool. But I argue that the body as tool analogy requires reconsideration in light of studies in scientific body ownership that demonstrate that a body experiences a very different sense of ownership over tools because they're not part of us. For example, a pencil that we might use to write is not part, generally felt as part of one's experience of the world in quite the same way as the biological hand that grips it. Frederica de Vimon argues that tools are embodied but only motorically and not perceptually. So she uses the rubber hand illusion uh, studies that originated from the late 1990s in the experiments of Matthew Botvinnik and Jonathan Cohen to identify that when a rubber hand is threatened with a hammer, participants react as if their own hand was being threatened. Corresponding, the object needs to be perceptually embodied for uh, participants to react effectively towards it. So tools don't prompt quite the same effective responses precisely because they're not experienced as incorporated within the body schema. And my particular usage of immersion in the title of this talk on immersive embodiment refers explicitly to perceptual embodiment. Um, so the selection of case studies in my talk um, place an emphasis on artists experimenting with the plasticity um, of the immersed participant, enabling effective experiences of a self that hyperextends beyond the protective layer of the skin to incorporate experiences of virtualized otherness as a proposed proximate, but ultimately impossible uh, fulfillment of an underlying immersive promise that we might feel with the body of an other. Philosopher of mind, Andy Clark, proposes that we see the world by guessing the world. Um, this is a notion that uh, is, is frequently exploited in various acts of misdirection in entertainment, for example, in stage illusions and in magic tricks. The mislocation um, in my book's title might be understood as another kind of perceptual quirk. So in common parlance, the verb mislocalize means to localize incorrectly, so to make an error of perception that involves the position of a sensory stimulus. The noun mislocalization can mean mistaken, erroneous or abnormal localization. So regarding the physical matter of bodies, the ability to identify and to localize limbs such as our hands in evolutionary terms has been described as crucial for our survival. In scientific studies in body ownership, localization specifically concerns the attribution of self-identity to a body, the spatial location of the self or the eye of experience and behavior. Erroneous localization or mislocalization of the body in a medical context can, can concern a variety of different kinds of phenomena. So for example, disturbances in body ownership caused by neurological conditions such as alien hand syndrome, the mislocalization of stimuli to a phantom limb, or referred sensations in peripersonal space, which is the region of space immediately around our bodies. But beyond neurological disorders, mislocalization also occurs in what medical models would understand as healthy bodies in proprioceptive illusion studies, such as the experimental out-of-body experiences using VR um, by um, people such as Enric Ayrshon, um, or body substitution illusions in which participants experience a sense of first-person ownership over a virtual surrogate body. There's a growing wealth of scientific investigations in body ownership that evidence the effects of owning a body other than our own. So, for example, illusory inhabiting the virtual body of a child or a rubber hand of a different ethnicity in a laboratory experiment. And regarding the latter, there have been objective measures using implicit association tests that have demonstrated a reduction in participants' implicit bias against different racial body types in the short term. Whilst in the long term, the effects are both unclear and difficult to measure. So there's some strong caveats there. 
Um, but in parallel with these scientific developments, mixed reality and self-style post-immersive theatre makers such as ZU UK have apprehended VR technologies, perhaps more commonly associated with shoot 'em ups in video gaming, to place audiences inside a, a six-year-old's body in good night sleep tight, exploring themes of intimacy, childhood, and homesickness. Installation of multimedia artists such as Carsten Hurler and Lundahl and Seitel have uh, also long integrated body illusions of different perceptual orders into their work. Not to scientifically test the mechaniz mechanisms of bodily selfhood, but either to provoke questions as to the parameter of, parameters of being a body, or to experientially transport immersions elsewhere, such as a blindfolded art gallery visitor imagining entering inside one of the frames of the paintings in Symphony of a Missing Room. And this is an illusion created using binaural spatialized sound. Practices that I gather under the umbrella term of theatres of mislocalised sensation might acknowledge a debt of knowledge from experimental studies and embodiment and directly smuggle scientifically tested intersensory illusions into aesthetic experiences, or they might stage less conscious resonances with related sets of scientific findings. But mislocalization understood as the occupying of a position outside of one's body towards a, a virtual proxy, whether that's a rubber hand or a virtual body or a computer generated avatar provides a useful conceptual framework to examine a deep-rooted immersive promise that much but not all immersive work seeks to realise. And the claim in my book is that illusions of mislocalization offer different kinds of expressions of the impossible fulfilment of the well-worn trope of body swapping, for which we will have encountered in various uh, narratives of science fiction. Increasingly, the embodiment of virtualized others has become a pervasive trend as a form of empathy activism in medical humanities. So one example is Jane Gauntlet's intersensory VR documentary performances, such as Waking in Slough and Dancing with Myself, in which Gauntlet uses multi-sensory stimulation to reconstruct her disorienting embodied sensations associated with the onset of her epileptic seizures. Participants in Waking in Slough are greeted by Jane, who furnishes them with objects she had on her at the time of the events reconstructed. So her handbag, her pen, a bottle of water and a watch. Uh, an Apple iPod Touch is strapped to an immersion's arm to distribute pre-recorded video and audio content to a pair of video glasses and headphones. And interactions are guided by a combination of audio commands, uh, Jane, Jane's unconscious inner thoughts, which we hear relayed by the headphones, and the movement of her hands on the screen, which we're invited to copy. The audience member is transported uh, to begin with to the platform of a train station in their goggles, uh, and the cues that we receive in the video um, align our senses with what we expect to feel, so the, the air of the wind rushing past on the platform. Uh, this is a significant difference, I suppose, between something like Catherine Richards' magic box that I referred to earlier, which is playing with sort of intersensory conflict. This is uh, initially trying to create sense certainty by aligning all of our senses with the virtual environment, so we believe that we're elsewhere. However, Gauntlet then strategically disrupts these sensory integrations to generate the uh, intersensory conflicts and false self-reports in the audience member's body with the onset of a simulated seizure. The water in the bottle uh, the audience were initially given develops a suddenly quite a strange metallic taste because the artist, unseen by the participant, has added lemon juice into the bottle. Objects that the immersant has interacted with suddenly aren't there anymore uh, in, the, in the place they're expected to be. White noise begins to underscore Jane's internal thoughts and she questions, as she begins to question internally what's happening to her. The immersant's head is gently but firmly pinned back in their chair uh, which begins to shake underneath them as their vision of the train lapses into darkness. The audience member's goggles and the headphones are suddenly taken off and a man is standing in front of you in a paramedic's uniform asking, do you know who you are? This was an interesting kind of jolting moment of de-immersion because the participant is suddenly resurfaced from the plunge into the video space which created the confusion as to which self is supposed to reply to that question. So without the video goggles, am I still performing as Jane? The physical encounter with the paramedic creates this disorientation, um, transitioning audiences abruptly between different perceptual levels of reality. And this artfully constructed confusion becomes a proxy for Gauntlet regaining consciousness in a public space, expressed through the peculiar demand that the immersant maintain a virtual identity 
once all the technological apparatus involved in constructing it is removed. In a creative process modelled on person-centred planning, Gauntlet has also worked as a mentor or facilitator with individuals such as traumatic brain injury patients to co-create immersive pieces for public, non-public or highly targeted groups of beneficiaries such as an individual's family or professional network of medical support. Gauntlet's work is not intended to have a clinical purpose and is not designated as therapy on the grounds that she's not a clinician nor has any formal training to treat individuals. Accordingly, she doesn't pathologize her collaborators or describe them as patients. The mentor-mentee relationship is unlike the clinician-patient relationship because it's rooted in equity and mutuality of experience. As a traumatic brain injury survivor herself, Gauntlet's understanding is commensurate with those uh, with whom she works. She enters into an exchange with her mentees, answering questions about her own recovery and process and engages in two-way story sharing which she notes can have a cathartic and empowering effect. The tailoring of, of a creative process such as this for different individuals is crucial for Gauntlet because some have difficulty in communicating post-trauma. The appropriate methods or forms or modalities used to tell these stories involve uh, an ongoing dialogue and the techniques used in Waking in Slough or Dancing with Myself may or may not be reused with, with others. While body transfer illusions can provide an effective technique towards empathy of a kind, virtual embodiment is not the end in and of itself. Gauntlet's personal interest in a particular kind of performance form doesn't take precedence over the needs and abilities of the individuals with whom she collaborates. As a result, the platforms of dissemination emerging from the creative process can vary quite considerably from a complex virtual reality piece to a simple downloadable audio file that can be shared um, on a playback device. Irrespective of the particular medium, the desired outcome is consistently to place specific audience groups in the mentee's shoes. The word that, that Jane uses commonly around um, this collaborative relationship is camaraderie, indicating the importance of developing trust and understanding to enable the mentee to enter a dialogue and some subsequently reconstruct their experiences for others. And in regard to authorship, Gauntlet's work prioritises the mentee as the lead artist and the work is created on their terms. As Gauntlet states, they have control over it, they own it. The artwork is confidential and is never exposed to public audiences beyond the target audience for whom the work is intended. The conflation of knowledge associated with the reactive shock of perhaps more frivolous scientific experiments of body ownership, for example, the response of recoiling when a perceptually embodied rubber hand is smashed with a hammer, to affix transmitted through the first person vantage point of neuroatypical bodies is, is a complex idea. And that it's inevitably more difficult to imagine that those experiences can be communicated because of what happens to knowledge claims when embodiment experiments are transposed as a form of empathy activism. Bodies and their hands can be marked very differently. And as Sarah Ahmed's uh, work on the cultural politics of emotion has identified, words for feelings can circulate and signs can generate effects by sticking to particular kinds of bodies. For example, when others become hateful, then actions of hate are directed against them. The potential efficacy of body transfer illusions such as gauntlets might be located in the potential in individual acts to dislodge signs from body types in effective economies, displacing one's proprioceptive feeling uh, to humanoid objects that are not felt as objects, but as bodily integrated. In addition, theatres of mislocalised sensation and the generating of autonomic re reactions through an immersive virtualised body subverts the prevalent hierarchies of feeling in Western culture that have been identified by theatre scholars such as Erin Hurley, in which emotion ranks over affect, human over animal and mind over body. Furthermore, empathy activism such as In My Shoes expressed through first person simulation is underpinned by an assumption that experiences inviting immersions to feel as others do might necessarily engender a positive moral response. And this is a notion that's been the source of considerable critique and scrutiny by commentators such as Paul Bloom in his book Against Empathy, The Case for Rational Compassion. Notwithstanding the, 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 the problem of knowledge, the epistemological problem of assuming that we can truly know what another feels or be ineffable, he argues that over-identification with another circumstances or condition could in fact lead to paralysis, or inaction or woe replicated. 
for example, the doctor who feels their patient's pain would be unlikely to be able to do their job is the um, example that he commonly gives. For Bloom, empathy of this kind is susceptible to a person's biases or prejudices, not least of all in terms of the conscious or unconscious selection of whom we might choose to empathise with. Furthermore, it's um, the safety and control underlying simulated experiences that can be freely exited at any time that Bloom suggests transforms unpleasant experiences into thrill-seeking attractions. He instead argues towards more distant, uh, rational compassion and what he terms as cost-benefit analysis. Though implicit in Bloom's view, uh, which notably sort of lapses into the quantitative language associated with appraising the desirability of a government mental policy, um, is a suspicion of the arousal of bodily sensation as a legitimate form of knowing within itself. I've also, this is something I've also grappled with um, in terms of my own practices research. Um, so this is a piece, I'm showing some, some images here from a piece called Transports, which um, investigated the difficulty of becoming immersed in a very particular kind of experience uh, linked to tremor um, as a Parkinsonian symptom. So Transports was um, not just a, a, an installation object, uh, but also a multi-stranded research inquiry that involves skills from multiple different disciplines and sustained collaboration with scientific partners and the charity Parkinson's UK. The R&D culminated in an interactive installation and which invited individual mem members of the public to participate in a first person simulation of a fictionalised subject living with young onset Parkinson's disease. Individuals in their 30s and 40s uh, living with young onset Parkinson's were a group that the charity had identified in our early discussions as particularly underrepresented in the public consciousness. So uh, it became a key intended, um, this group became a key intended beneficiary for the project and the research. So this installation used actually very low budget technical components uh, in combination with multi-sensory stimulation as a method to engender in participants a feeling of ownership over a virtual hand. So the aim was to cultivate an embodied understanding and a personal sense of living with a symptom associated with young onset Parkinson's disease. The technology in use in transports acts as both an intermediary between a vir virtual and actual hands and an intervention designed to deliberately disrupt the coordination of the participant's limb involved in the performance of, mo of a motor skill. Transport's installation was comprised of, of a number of technical components, and these were hidden inside a, a sort of scientific a, a, a box that has this sort of image, the aesthetic of kind of scientific instrumentation. But once the, this case is opened, it tri triggers a mechanism that pops up its contents and lays out a dinner table in front of the participant, revealing props with which they would interact. So the case contained a hidden Raspberry Pi computer, so a credit card size computer that controlled a motorised glove that replicated a four to six hertz tremor in the participant's left or right hand. The computer also uh, distributed pre-recorded point of view video footage displayed on a handheld monitor and binaural sound heard through headphones. The participant is cast as a man living with young onset Parkinson's in his early 30s. And within this 15 minute experience, uh, transport stages a reenactment of his remembered experience of the onset of his symptoms at the head table of a wedding reception just before he's about to deliver the best man's speech. The immersant follows the cues on the video to mimic the task that Andrew's hand undertakes whilst hearing his inner thoughts as he rehearses his address to the wedding guests. The clink of the groom champagne flute is heard in the headphones and this ushers Andrew to stand in front of a room full of expectant guests. Um, and this is underscored in the experience by a stream of anxious thoughts as the participant grips the best man's speech and the glove starts to produce a tremor in the audience's hand at a frequency that makes the words on the page impossible to read. The rationale for the project was an enmeshment of, of personal and professional interests in the subjective experience of individuals living with Parkinson's disease. My personal connection to the disease's effects was through my grandmother, Irish Beecher, who was diagnosed in 1983 after experiencing problems gripping objects in her hand. My co director Hannah Barker had a professional interest in the experience of those living with Parkinson's, having previously worked part time for Parkinson's UK charity. Uh, alongside our work with Analog as a theatre company uh, to develop their volunteering strategy. So as participatory action research, our process followed in the tradition of what Paolo Freer as practitioners 
uh, researchers facilitating a process of inquiry involving multiple stakeholders who are also involved in the research design, data gathering, data analysis, and implementation of action steps resulting from the research. Transport's research and development project was also undertaken in consultation with behavioural neuropsychologist Professor Narendra Ramnani from Royal Holloway University and the chari- uh, numerous volunteers from Parkinson's UK. Both the project's scientific advisors and the charity played a significant role in aiding Analog's research by deepening our understanding of both the pathology and lived experience, uh, experiences of Parkinson's and they brokered key relationships with volunteers to support the installation's development. Our script writing process, which was an iterative process of sharing drafts with a group of anonymized volunteers who would comment on the uh, how accurately they felt we captured some of the experiences that they'd had. Um, so this was, and also we're using, I suppose, drawing on the charity's immense expertise to advise on best ethical practice when collaborating on si- alongside individuals living with young onset Parkinson's. So it was a nine month research and development process divided into eight different phases of uh, of activity, which is outlined in this workflow diagram. I will, I won't go through this now for sure, but I will make these slides available to anybody who'd like to have a look. It's only in retrospect that we could really clearly map out the journey of this of this nine month research and development. So um, if that's of, of interest to anyone. Um, I was going to play a video clip, which was a testimonial from one of our volunteers called Jason Batup, who, and it was taken from a micro documentary that was created around the project. And this was an interview that captured Jason's um, response after participating in the user testing phase of the installation. Um, Jason was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at the age of 41. Um, I am aware there's been some issues with sound, so I think it's possible I won't be able to play this for you right now. But again, I will make this available to you via the slides afterwards. Um, But what Jason comments on, I suppose, is is what he perceived to be the accuracy of the experience in creating a particular version of tiredness that he experiences. So he comments in the video that there's a particular kind of tiredness that associates the symptom of tremor that's very, very hard to describe. This was one of the things that he felt was captured quite well within the experience of of user testing the installation. Um, uh, Various other uh, professionals and volunteers took part in this installation and and capturing their feedback was a big part of trying to understand what we've made and and how um, efficacious it could be, where its applications might be. Um, So Head of Professional Engagement and Education at Parkinson's, uh, Dega Heisters reported um, after her participation but she could see this method being used for health and social care professionals to understand who they're looking after. She said, you read a textbook, you listen to your patient, but you don't necessarily get to feel like they do for a little time. And that's incredibly powerful. I think the notable thing about a testimonial such as this is that it it directly contradicts Paul Bloom's previously mentioned assertion that empathy conceptualizes feeling as others do can, instead of leading to inaction and woe replicated, actually could have um, a useful application for healthcare professionals. And Heister's rather aligns with uh, the late neuroscientist Oliver Sacks, who remarkably invokes the um, a quote from Michel Foucault, which is an unusual thing, I think, for a neuroscientist to, to do. Um, and he writes this in his book, An Anthropologist on Mars. So in addition to the objective approach of the scientists, we must employ an intersubjective approach too, leaping, as Foucault writes, into the interior of morbid consciousness trying to see the pathological world with the eyes of the patient. So Sachs, via uh, summoning the spirit of Foucault, repositions which knowledges are valued and taken into account. Similarly, um, we shared this installation with a number of BSc psychology students at Royal Holloway University who completed anonymous questionnaires after participation all of whom reported they believed that immersive first-person approaches to understanding lived experiences of a condition would help them to acquire knowledge that empirical data alone would not be able to communicate. Of course, I've mentioned the word empathy quite a lot, and I've talked about empathy uh, activism, but of course it's worth just um, revisiting uh, um, what we mean by empathy. So empathy originating from the Greek empatheia, subsequently from the German Einfühlung, um, while the, and while the meaning of empathy varies from one discipline to another, in psychology, Simon Baron Cohen has defined empathy as our ability to identify what someone else is thinking or feeling and to respond to that person's thoughts and feelings with an appropriate emotion. 
So empathy is under, understood in as, as something that is relational. It occurs between the self um, and other. Um, Emmanuel Levinas's ethics is quite useful here as well to, when thinking about empathy concerning recognizing another's differences in the face-to-face -face encounter. So in Levinasian ethics, the face is conceptualized as that that can't be possessed by our conceptual grids. It instates difference, it resists possession. The other is um, utterly unknowable. And as Mary uh, Ruti contends in between Levinas and Lacan's self-other ethics, for Levinas, the face ensures that the other remains completely transcendent, utterly foreign, in the sense that I cannot reduce uh, them to what is familiar to me. This is quite important, I think, because embodiment illusions of different orders uh, enter into a complicated relationship with, with Levinas's ideas of the ethical encounter. Um, partly this is because it displaces the face in quite a, a particular way. So in both transports and the earlier example I gave of B and other labs uh, VR body swapping, but the majority of those experiences, the user occupies a position behind the face or certainly within a first person uh, gaze. So through this act of effacement, a proprioceptive possession occurs in which the sensations of the participant are referred to a mediatized bodily set of appendages. So in this respect, it's the eclipsing of the face that enables a phenomenal self, or put uh, differently, those aspects of selfhood that are defined through our perception by our senses, to incorporate body images um, of the other and to feel that it's part of their own body schema. But this, but, uh, this virtual embodiment doesn't dispense with the difference of the other that Levinas recognises as encapsulated by the face, I would propose. Rather, it enables participants to feel that they might embody that difference. In this respect, what stage is misrecognition rather than recognition? Ruti identifies that Levinas privileges relationality over ontology, so relations to other bodies versus being a body. However, a virtualized body swap is, is, is a peculiarity in that sense because it confuses this binary between the relational, that which exists in between people, and the ontological one's own sense of being. Aligned with Levinas, experiences such as a VR body swap with a refugee are concerned with our connection to others, but through the deployment of an illusion in which the other, as an image, feels incorporated within our phenomenal self. But does this proprioceptive apprehension of the other occupy an anti-Levinasian ethical position in its very form? It is the ideology embedded in this virtual kind of exchange that the other might somehow be reducible or assimilative to us. I think that the, the in answer to that question, I think the self in Levinas his discourse is quite a problematically self-contained entity. By contrast, more recent knowledge from studies in embodiment have demonstrated the plasticity of bodily selfhood, which is not hardwired. While aligned with Lebanese alterity, the other's experiences um, can never be directly lived or relived. But in intimate acts of virtual bodily displacement, um, the feeling of, of owning a body is breached through a willful act of self-deception in order to mutually explore the impacts of phenomena such as mass human displacement of others or um, sensory experiences such as uh, Parkinsonian tremor. Much as pain can be referred to an absent limb, feeling can be referred to um, a virtual uh, body. While temporary possession of the other that stage is consciously known to be a falsification, put another way, I think we're never unaware that this is not a real body swap. We are not swapping bodies with anybody. Um, nonetheless, the illusion elicits unconscious physiological responses from our bodies as if it were real. So we're trick tricking our bodies into, um, into believing a reality that, that we intellectually know to be an illusion. Our physical sense of vulnerability to threat is kind of outsourced to this virtual body. Um, the, the previous um, director of, of the in chief of the Arts Council, Peter Baselgat, in, in his book, uh, The Empathy Instinct, How to Create a More Civil Society, argues that empathy can be simultaneously part of the solution and the problem. In response to troubling post-Brexit outbreaks of racism, he draws on primatologist Franz de Waal, who quotes uh, a saying, we've evolved to hate our enemies, to distrust anybody who doesn't look like us. Even if we are largely cooperative within our communities, we become almost a different animal in our treatment of strangers. This understanding produces the idea that our empathy equipment, uh, which can produce both loyalty with some and produce potentially hostility towards others, 
while scientifically tested body illusions might be one effective medium for progress to facilitate empathic encounters, I would argue it's not the progress in and of itself. And the longer term impacts and efficacy of body transfer illusions require a lot more sustained investigation. But if Levinasian ethics seeks to overcome the ontological complacency, so the primacy of ourselves, VR body illusions draw our attention to the malleability of selfhood and potentially, potentially <laughs> hint at, at possible applications for longer lasting transformations. And at that point, I'm going to I'm going to draw to a close. So I'll stop sharing my screen if I can.